These two are kind of crazy, especially the bromocyclohexane. I debated on even showing these ones to you this early on in this stuff, but uh, I'm going to explain it so well, even you noobs will get it. Just kidding. Here we go. So we got N-octane. N, uh, you can think of it as normal, and meaning that it's straight across. And it's not cyclic or anything like that. So there's carbon one there. That's the methyl. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yep, eight carbons, octane, like octopus has eight arms. And we're also going to look at bromocyclohexane. So you can see the bromine there. That makes sense in the name. Cyclohexane, it's a cycle. That's cyclo. And it's a hexane because it has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Remember, you could think of a hex as like what a witch can put on you. And a hex, a witch can be evil, like the number 666. So think six hex, hexagon. Okay, here's our N octane. NMR spectrum. So I asked you to first draw the bond line structure of the molecule. Here it is. And do I have eight carbons? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I do. And that's so much quicker and easier to draw. It just looks so much cleaner, I think, than all these CH3, CH2, CH2. So I really like the bond structures. So first off, the two methyls on the end are equivalent. Crazy. All the way across, they're equivalent like that. Then the two methylenes in, the first step in, they're equivalent because, for example, this methylene has a methyl on one side of it and then uh, six carbons on the other side. This methylene has a methyl on one side of it and six carbons on the other side. So they're equivalent, and I bet you're guessing the next one correctly. Those two methylenes are equivalent. And finally, the middle two are equivalent. So we have one, two, three, four groups of hydrogens for this molecule. Our NMR spectrum looks like it only has two signals though, huh? So it must be that some of these are overlapping, they're too similar. Okay, so first I'll label, now I'll label my, uh, my signals, that's signal A, and here is a zoom in of signal A, so signal A is a little past one, so see that's a little past one. And then here's signal B, and then here's a zoom in of signal B, it looks kind of like a little bit ugly triplet-ish, huh? Signal A looks like a singlet, but it's not. Uh, all right, and then finally we have the uh, TMS over here at zero. That's our reference to set everything. Every, these parts per million are all re relative to TMS at zero. Okay, so this actually winds up being signal B. And you would guess that probably because it's six car hydrogens. Well, well, it says six there. <laughs> but also uh, it's a, it would have this three hydrogens would have two neighbors. That would make it a triplet. So there we go, triplet. And then A is, uh, these two are in the A area, and these are also in the A area, and so is this. So these two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve hydrogens are all overlapping in this A area. It makes it look like a singlet, but it's not. It's just they're all on top of each other. And this happens a lot with um, linear alkanes like this. What you'll see is a, a little past one, a big like clump. And then below one, you'll see an ugly looking triplet for the ends of the alkane. All right, so B is a six hydrogen triplet because these three hydrogens only see two neighbors, two neighbors N plus one, so two plus one is three. So that's a three hydrogen triplet. Over here, we also have a three hydrogen triplet and they're equivalent, so they overlap perfectly to make a six hydrogen triplet. And then next up, this, Next one's in there, a four hydrogen sextet. And I'm doing that because it probably won't look like a sextet. So the reason why the question mark is there, remember, is because the three neighbors over here are not the same as the two neighbors over here. So these guys see three neighbors on one side and two different neighbors on the other. So three and two is five. So five neighbors, n plus one is five plus one is six. So sextet. Oh, and now I'm going right to the middle. I kind of jumped over that one, but that's okay. So these ones, a lot of times people get confused with this one. This is a four hydrogen triplet. Um, you can't see it because they're all just on top of each other here, but we want to predict it as a four hydrogen, four hydrogen triplet because we have two hydrogens here that have two neighbors to the one side, making them a triplet. And then these two hydrogens, are they neighbors with the? No, they're not neighbors, they're equivalent. So let's just consider 
non-equivalent neighbors for coupling. So we have a triplet, a two-hydrogen triplet, another two-hydrogen triplet. They overlap, the four-hydrogen triplet. Okay, and then finally this one is a four-hydrogen pentad because it, the, the two hydrogens here have two neighbors to one side, two different neighbors to the other side, and these are different because this neighbor's in the middle of the molecule, these two neighbors, and these are closer to the end, right? So this guy's got neighbors, four neighbors, but they're not equivalent, so we put the question mark on the end there. And then same for that. This is a four, two hydrogen penta, overlapping a two hydrogen penta. All right, so we got it. And then uh, as I was saying earlier in the text that uh, these can get so complicated, they kind of get easier. So we don't even get to see the coupling in here. So if you just see like a clump and then you see an ugly triplet, a little less than one, you're usually like, oh, that's a long alkane. All right, now the cyclo, uh, bromocyclohexane. This one's brutal. So here we are again, let's draw it uh, as a bond line structure. There it is. But you know what? This isn't going to help us. This isn't going to be able to help us accurately group all our hydrogens for these signals. And you notice these are kind of rough looking, huh? Not pretty doublets or triplets. That's normal for cycloalkanes. So let, let me show you what I mean. We need to actually show the wedges and dashes like we saw earlier with the uh, methyl cyclopentane example. Because the bromine, if we show it wedged out at us, it's going to be closer to this wedged out hydrogen here than it is to the dashed back hydrogen there. So this hydrogen and this hydrogen are not equivalent. And if I kept it in the bond line structure, I might think, oh, those two are equivalent, but they're not. All right, so there's not really a lot of room here to like circle all the groups along this. So I'm gonna move this over. There we go, I made it a little bigger too. So, oh, I went a little fast. So that's definitely one hydrogen by itself, unique hydrogen. It's the one that's on the carbon with the bromine. Nobody else has a, a bromine on their carbon as well. And then these two wedged out ones on the same side of, of bromine, they are equivalent. And then the two dashed in the back are equivalent. So, But this is not equivalent to that. Crazy, huh? Then you'll see the same pattern here. Two hydrogens wedged up. They're closer to bromine. They're a group. And then these two in the back dashed away. They're further from bromine. And then the last two. This one's closer to bromine and the dashed one is on the other side of the cyclohexyl ring so it's going to be further from bromine okay and let's start labeling our spectrum that would be signal a the most downfield b c d e and uh how do how do we predict these so tms uh, i think tms was a uh, not quite seen yeah it looks like it's where we started the scale like a half so tms should be over there all right so this signal is A, uh, which should you know that at this point? No, you shouldn't know that at this point, but you might guess it because, I don't know, it's the one next to the bromine. We're actually going to learn soon that electronegative atoms like bromine do something called deshielding, and they make their, these signals go more downfield. But I'm just going to tell you that if you hadn't guessed that, that's fine. All right, now these other ones, they're, I don't even know how to guess them. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to call signal... I'm going to say the, the, the phrase, like if, if a particular grouping of hydrogens, it's signal B or C or D or E, and let's represent that with X. Okay, so here we go. So uh, this these two in the back, I'm going to say they're either signal B, C, D, or E. I, I don't know. I'm just going to put that there. And then the same with the red ones here. These, red, these two hydrogens are either B, C, D, or E. Um, same with that one there, those two, and these two, and that one, and that one. So we don't know what they are, but we can still um, predict the coupling, even though we can see they don't, they're not turning out so pretty like that. So I'll, I'll, let's look at the prediction. So for signal A, that's a one hydrogen signal. It has this hydrogen here can see that neighbor there. It's only one, two, three bonds away. It can also see this neighbor this one and this one. So it has four neighbors it can see. Are the neighbors all equivalent? Nope. These two wedged out ones are different than the dashed ones because of the presence of the bromine. So this guy has four neighbors, penta, and, and it's question mark because they're not equivalent. So one hydrogen penta. Ah, and now this guy. Let's look at this one. This guy has one neighbor there. 
one neighbor there, that's two. And then three, four neighbors. It has four different neighbors, so it's definitely not, it needs a question mark. So that's a one, uh, so these two at the back are two hydrogen pentane. All right, here we go again. Two hydrogens here. Let's use this as a representative. One neighbor there, one neighbor there, two, three, four. So yeah, two hydrogen pentane. Okay, what about these guys? So this guy sees two neighbors over there, one there and one there. So two, three, four, oh, five. It sees two neighbors. So it's actually seeing five neighbors. So these guys are a two hydrogen sextet. All right, next up, this one in the back, same thing. You can see the pattern. Okay, I'll use this as a representative. It's got its geminal neighbor, the neighbor that's on the same carbon. And then it's got these two over here, that's three. And then it's got the two over here, four, five. So five plus one is six. And this last, these last two, so this guy has the geminal neighbor that's on the same carbon as it. And then these two and these two. So it's got five total. So that's also a one hydrogen sextet. And the last one, same thing, 100 sex time. <sighs> okay. So uh, we weren't able to like narrow down like, oh, which one is signal B with the information we have? But um, we can actually find that online. So if here are some uh, spectrums, uh, proton NMR spectrums of cy bromocyclohexane from the SDBS website. So here's one, and this one is a 90 megahertz NMR. You can see it looks different than what we just were looking at. It's more overlapping there. And then here is from STBS, the 400 megahertz. So this is the uh, cleaner spectrum, well, slightly, than what we were seeing, like what we saw earlier. So the stronger the magnetic field, the higher the megahertz, and the, uh, the better the spectrum you get. Um, so this, you can see there's a lot of overlap. It couldn't resolve all the signals, but here you got a lot less overlap. Still get a little bit, actually. Um, so why not just everybody use a 400 megahertz NMR? The reason why is the 90 megahertz NMR might cost you like, uh, I don't know, $100,000. The 400 megahertz NMR might cost you a million. And you got to pay a lot of money uh, to, to keep supplying it with liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. Okay, so the 400 megahertz NMR spectrum is better though, right? Okay, so now I'm taking the uh, that 400 megahertz NMR spectrum from SDVS. I'm zooming in on it. I kind of stretched it out a bit. And uh, SDVS uses advanced techniques to actually assign the groups, that which we couldn't. So I'll just go ahead and show you that real quick. The TMS, um, we're not seeing it. And we in almost all the SDVS spectrums, you don't see the TMS. And I, I think what they do is they, they add a little bit of TMS, just like a very low concentration. And so it's down here, but we don't see it but they can find it by like expanding out the peak. So you can actually make this, uh, these signals super large. And then this, the, every little thing down here starts to grow. And then you can find the TMS, set it to zero and then lower it back down and not see it. I think that's what they like to do to try to like, they don't want you to see the TMS cause it's not this molecule. I actually like to see the TMS cause in a research setting, you almost always see it. Okay, so uh, there's signal A right there. And it happens to be A like we thought. And then here's signal B. So where does signal B end up? Oh, it ended up these two back behind the ring, further from bromine, were signal B. And also, oh, and then now, now on to C. C are these two that are on the side of bromine. And then uh, see how C looks like it's got a lot of area to it? It's also these two overlapping those two. So the, the two on the bromine side and the other two on the bromine side, they're overlapping here. And then D is uh, right here. This, this, this single one on the opposite side of bromine is D. And E is an overlap of these two signals, these two hydrogens here, and this last one by itself on the same side as bromine. So pretty interesting, huh? Um, and there's no way you should be able to predict these, but I'll let you know which ones you should be able to predict. I just wanted to show you that it's possible. Also, uh, I want you to notice that with cycloalkanes, you don't have that triplet around one part, a little less than one parts per million, like you see in a long linear alkane, if you remember. And also, you usually just see a big mess right here. 
like no clear doublets, triplets. And, and for us, our instrument, we don't have a 400 megahertz NMR, so I'll show you, I'll go back a little bit real quick. So for us, you'll see more like this kind of stuff. Just like when you see a big mess between one and two, you're like, oh, that's probably cycloalkane. So even though cycloalkanes are challenging, they get to make such a big mess, they're kind of characteristic of them. And then um, real quick, I'll go back again to the linear alkanes. You could tell the difference between them and a cycloalkane because they have the uh, this ugly looking triplet a little less than one. And then their, their overlapping stuff is a little more clean usually. All right, so now uh, that was it, huh? I think that's it. Can do it all. Yeah, so you guys can do it, even your noobs, right? Just kidding. Okay, back to your Google Docs intro document.